Hi everyone, thank you very much. I'm really excited to present this session today at ISTOCON, despite the time now, but it makes me even more motivated to, to go through that together. Okay, so Maria already presented me uh, quickly, so I will go directly with today's agenda. So today we will have a quick introduction on Istio and Mercalli and two main sections. The first section is about stabilizing Istio and the second about adopting Istio. So quickly about Istio at Mercalli. First, a quick PR time. Uh, Mercalli is a Japanese uh, C2C marketplace where people can sell used items. And we are also in the US and I think we had uh, CM, CM during the Super Bowl. So if you saw this, maybe you know what is Mercalli. Uh, and quickly about Mercalli, there are like few uh, numbers, 200 micro more than 200 microservices, uh, one main cluster, 12,000 pods, more than 705 uh, uh, nodes. And uh, at Mercalli, we started uh, Istio in April 2019 with a POC. Then we had our first release in production first uh, release with Istio in production around five months later. And today we have around 25% of our production services running with Istio and 50% in development. And our plan is by the end of this year to have 100% of our, our, our services migrated. So what we are currently using as far as features are related, we are mainly using the HTTP2 load balancing, uh, some traffic shifting, MTLS, permissive mode, and we are currently under investigating retries or circuit breaking. So the first half of this presentation will be about explaining how to stabilize Istio and how we proceeded into making it. Uh, stabilize implies that something here Istio is not stable or not stable enough, and in our case, it was not enough. Uh, first, we will quickly explain the specifications of the Istio Saika proxy to understand how and why we had to stabilize it on Kubernetes. After that, we will explore an important question we hope we had asked ourselves one year and a half ago. Uh, then we will explain how a full mesh is utopian and the importance of knowing only what you need. And finally, we will briefly explain about some guardrails for Istio. So, Let's start with the Istio Sidecar proxy specifications. We have pod running in Kubernetes. It has two containers, an application container and a Sidecar container. With Istio, all incoming traffic must flow through the Sidecar first when entering the pod. And all outgoing traffic must flow through the Sidecar before leaving the pod. So what happens when the Sidecar container is not ready? Because it intercepts all the traffic. What is going to happen is, the incoming traffic is sank into the void because it's not ready to take it. And the outgoing traffic cannot leave the pod. So we have some issues here. Then uh, there are like usually two cases where it happens. Uh, the first one is during the pod creation and the second one on pod deletion. This is quite troublesome because these events happen very often in Kubernetes. So we need to prevent them by making sure that Envoy is started before any other container in a pod and Envoy is stopped after any other container in a pod. So now that we explained the Istio specifications and the issue with the sidecar availability, let's go to how Kubernetes handles pods with sidecars. So in Kubernetes, a pod is the atomic unit, not the container. And so in this regard, uh, Kubernetes lacks some good control APIs to customize the container's lifecycle in a pod. In fact, there is no official way to instruct a pod to start the sidecar container first or stop the sidecar container after the app container is stopped. However, we can wrap a pod lifecycle using the container lifecycle hooks to achieve our goal. So the workaround consists of using lifecycle hooks called post start and pre stop. First, to ensure that Envoy is started before any container in a pod, we need to use a post start lifecycle hook in the Istio proxy container manifest. So the lifecycle is basically, is basically delaying the next containers from running until the command exists, exits. So it waits until the proxy is ready. The trick was found by Marco Luxa that I really wish to thank 
by this occasion for integrating it into Istio 1.8 with a new field hold application until proxy starts, which is quite explicit and managed in the mesh config, default config in the Istio operator file. Secondly, we need to ensure that Envoy is stopped after any other container in a pod. And there are two things required. The first one is to use a pre-stop lifecycle hook in the Istio proxy container manifest. So this command may look a bit unfamiliar, but it's quite simple. It will uh, simply wait for the application connections to be drained before stopping the container. The second thing required for the stop phase is to use a pre-stop lifecycle hook in the application container manifest. This pre-stop hook will first make the application to sleep to let the downstream gRPC connections terminate, then drain the Envoy listeners, and finally sleep to give enough time for draining the remaining connections. The last command is about handling the container restart cases because we had some issues with application container restart that would trigger the hook and leave the sidecar in an endless draining mode. The last thing to do here is to make sure that you adjust your pod's termination grace per second to be more than the sum of all sleeps in the pre-stop hooks. Because once the period expires, a sick kit is sent to the pod, dropping all the connections that were not uh, drained yet, leading to 5xx. So make sure that you have enough time to finish the drain. Uh, so be, please be careful, because these are workarounds, not solutions. So test before using. You need to understand what you're adding to your cluster. It's the same as Linux copy paste. You paste, you don't paste command that you don't understand. Ideally, uh, and this should be deprecated once the community supports the sidecars officially. So the second shortcoming uh, in Kubernetes is about auto-scaling multiple containers pods. So Kubernetes has two ways to auto-scale pods using horizontal pod auto-scaler, HPA, and vertical pod auto-scaler, VPA. Unfortunately, it's not very smart at scaling out pods with multiple containers with HPA. Uh, but fortunately, it was fixed in Kubernetes 1.20 uh, by specifying a container resource as an HPA target, but we are not in that version yet. So in the meantime, we need to add the Istio sidecar into the HPA calculation. So for our calculation, we have a simple example, one pod with one application container and the resource set as one CPU. So for this container, we have an HPA configuration, which is a triggering uh, the scaling out at 70% average CPU utilization, which means when it uses more than 700 millicores of CPU. So now we have a sidecar added to the pod with 100 millicores of CPU. And since the HPA takes the average of all container CPU request values, the HPA will now scale at 770 millicores of CPU. So we had a change in the uh, threshold to scale out, which is quite problematic for existing users that don't know about this. So to limit the availability risk of HPA, we have two options. The first is to make the Easter proxy CPU very low compared to the application CPU. So ideally it should be so between some X percent and Y percent of the application CPU to minimize the variance, but we, need to keep in mind that a too low value will make the proxy to throttle, decreasing the performance. The upper bound should also be in an acceptable chain uh, range to minimize the impact on the initial HPA. And it will only work also if the amount of traffic can be handled by the proxy resources. Then the second option is to adjust the HPA threshold to match the original CPU absolute target, in this case, 700 millicores. So for this specific case, we would need to reduce the target percentage to 63.6% to have the same scaling behavior as before. We currently try the second option at Mercalli. So both options have their drawback. And the main one is that you need to involve users in the calculation or doing it by yourself. In, in both cases, it's a huge time uh, consumer. So, uh, and it's pretty hard to estimate what is the ideal Istio Sidecar container CPU uh, capacity 
uh, and resource to use. And we talked about this in the second part of the presentation. Now we get to the question uh, we wanted to ask ourselves when we started Istio one year and a half ago, are we prepared to handle it? And to answer this question, we need first to identify the main time consumers with Istio. The biggest time consumer is so far the troubleshooting. You have so many things to check when you added proxies everywhere in your infrastructure, and this increase with the number of features that you're using. The second biggest uh, time consumer is spreading the adoption, evangelizing, sharing knowledge, convincing the business, convincing your users. The human inter interaction is takes a lot of time and it's very hard. And the last thing is supporting the new features, learning, mastering, abstracting, all those things take, take time, especially the abstraction. Considering that, we think that to succeed in adopting Istio, you need first, and it's very important, to have dedicated resources for it. The more, the better. We had the, the opposite case where we have few people and it, it took time, despite our best efforts. Uh, then you also need a good in-house knowledge of networking, like people that know about Linux, Kubernetes, Envoy, cloud networking. You, you want someone to fix the magic when it breaks, so you need some wisdom that in your company. Uh, and you also need to be patient and resi resisting the temptations from the users to open the features too early because it really may lead to disasters. And finally, you need mechanisms to improve the reliability of Istio, such as rules, processes, abstractions, etc. Also, please choose your fights and start small with few simple features such as injecting the sidecar, doing uh, out of the box HTTP2 load balancing or traffic shifting for Canary. And the important point is to build the confidence in the system and the understanding of Istio. Then you can onboard some users, get feedback, improve, rinse and repeat. So uh, we are not in a dream. Uh, the dream. We are now in a dream, sorry. The dream that uh, service meshes usually promise full mesh observability, reachability, and simplicity by just plug it in. And shall the magic unleash the said, but the reality is different. The reality is that the control plane is burning down when pushing your thousand services updates to the hundreds of proxies running, that your proxies are OM killed every X minutes because they cannot handle the change frequency, that your proxies are heavily CPU throttling, and consuming CPU even without traffic. That's incredible. And uh, you also have a resource usage that is tremendous because of that. And finally, your Envoy configuration files are terribly big that you would not even want to look into that. So it's a reality far from the utopia. And Istio is almost impossible to use at any scale over than small POCs without restricting the exposed resources to each proxy in the mesh. It is even written in the, the official documentation. And actually, uh, although it's formulated differently, that reference values are only disclosed for when the namespace isolation is enabled. So what about namespace isolation? I thought this is called uh, the sidecar CRD, which is a bit misleading uh, name from time to time. Uh, it allows basically to control the exposure of the mesh configuration to specific proxies based on namespace or labels. So here we have a simple sidecar example. I will not go deep into how sidecar works. We only really want here to know that we have an allow list that shares the listeners, clusters, endpoints with the local proxies to leverage the Istio features. Uh, next is about some graphs we took from our Datadog production Istio demonitoring. And you can see that it's clearly night and day. Above, uh, on top of that is without the Sika CRD, you can see so many spikes uh, periodically happening. And with the Sika implemented everywhere, it's like never spiky. Or when it's spiky, it's very, very controlled. And I think it was taken when we only had 10% of our production services with Istio in the cluster. So I wouldn't really imagine the difference now with now. Uh, so it looks great, but there is a drawback to this approach. The, the thing is that you need your services to know their dependencies, 
document and update them. So if it wasn't the case before, it, it may be not really good for your users. Like they may feel that is to ask too much from them. Uh, and the thing is that when a dependency is not in the allowed list of the sidecar CRD, then the service mesh features will not be able, available for that traffic. So that causes a lot of different issues because of pass-through cluster. More information in the link if you're interested. Uh, so we we found some approaches to mitigate that. And first of all, in any case, do not expose the sidecar CRD to users. Instead, try to use a service definition to de generate the sidecars. The, the users don't really need to know the underlying implementation. You can use a format that you can reuse for other purposes, such as, for example, egress security policy. Uh, there are other options. You can use protocol-specific traffic sniffing, like gRPC call discovery to find uh, the dependencies, or maybe some eBPF magic to get the service calls. And by the way, if anyone does that, we are really interested in hearing more about this, so don't hesitate to reach me. Um, and, and now we are using the first approach because it's protocol agnostic and it works before having live traffic because the, the second and third options require you to have some traffic flowing before. So the last part of the stabilizing issue is about uh, grad rays. So it's an excerpt from my last year presentation. So basically the service mesh is common to all users and any change to it spreads across the world mesh. So it also means that any misconfiguration spread. And because humans are error prone and that both users and operators are human, error will happen with a large blast radius. So how can we mitigate errors and their impact? There are two ways. The first one is to leverage linters such as conf tests to catch issues at CI level and by keeping a short feedback loop for the user experience. And the second one is to leverage admission webhooks, such as OPA Gatekeeper, to protect your resources and check what cannot be checked at the internal level, especially the inventory. This is important because ultimately the source of truth is what is in your cluster at any time. So if you have the rules matched against it, it's the most relevant there. So if you want more uh, details, please check my last year in presentation, preparing the grad race for Isco at scale. Uh, now that we are done with uh, stabilizing Istio, let's summarize the takeaways. So we first saw that Kubernetes doesn't handle the sidecar containers well, and that we need to use the post-start and pre-stop container hooks to gracefully handle the pod life cycle. We also found out that Kubernetes doesn't scale the is enabled pods very well. So we need to use container resource to fix the HPA on the application container if you have an up-to-date cluster. Otherwise, you need to add uh, the sidecar proxy CPU usage into the calculation for HPA scale target. We also discussed the, that exposing only a few Istio features helps with Istio adoption and the stability and that you must use the sidecar CRDs to keep Istio healthy and find mechanisms to handle this automatically. Finally, a grad race such as Gatekeeper OPA are really crucial to ensure the long-term stability of Istio and your sanity. Uh, so now that we stabilized Istio, let's move on to the adoption part, which is equally important in my opinion. So in this section, we will go through several adoption challenges that blocked us or severely uh, slowed us down. So the first one is uh, about our move uh, from uh, client-side HTTP2 load balancing to Envoy. So at Mercalli, we use gRPC quite heavily in our uh, services, but Kubernetes is pretty bad at load balancing it. So we solved it with a client-side load balancing coupled with headless services. And the interesting thing is that to us, headless services are what cluster IP services are to common people. So we call cluster IP service a non-headless service. That, that's very interesting and confusing for many people sometimes. And however, uh, our KubeDNS was not really happy at all with all the SRE requests that were re requested by that library. 
So we were considering uh, some options and then Istio came with its awesome HTTP2 load balancing capabilities out of the box. We tried it as it is uh, with our existing gRPC services, but the result was that weird 5xx on upstream service pod rollout were happening. So no matter how well our services handled graceful termination, Istio would make the headless services worse. So as a conclusion, we stopped to use headless services with Istio and gradually migrated to cluster IP services. So this was the start of a long road of pain, uh, the road of hundreds of services. Uh, yeah, so in Kubernetes, services have some immutable fields such as name or cluster IP for some good reasons. So for each service migration, we have two steps. The first is to write the cluster IP service equivalent to the headless service. And the second one is to make sure that all Istio enabled callers update their config with the cluster IP service. And so we have a double standard during the migration, which is pretty costly to, to, to maintain. And when you compound this to hundreds of services, the cost is terrible. So we really need to be strategic on that. Uh, so our strategy to migrate services, it's four items, abstract, explain, support, and track. Abstract is about making the abstractions to roll out the behind the scene changes so that users don't see them. Explain is about changing the changes that will be facing the users and the motivation behind it to make them understand. Uh, the support is about facilitating the service owners by preparing some pull request campaigns for Istio enable services so that they don't have too much work to do to enable Istio and get uh, up and running. And finally, tracking is about keeping the inventory of services by status. For example, having a cluster IP service or Istio enabled so that you can track the, the progress of the adoption. So the next adoption challenge we faced was the label selector update for the app and version labels in Kubernetes deployments. First, I want to ask a question to everyone in the audience, even though I cannot see you. But is there anyone in the audience that was patient enough to use the Apple version before uh, starting Istio? And if you're like us, chances are huge that you had to modify your deployments to put these labels. But why do we want these labels anyway? Because we all want fancy traffic shifting features. And then you try to update and you get some face palm moment. You can not modify label selectors from Kubernetes 1.16. That's terrible. First, we had the header services, now the labels. And we are thinking, what is coming next? And then that issue is really not about only adding sidecars. It's very important to realize that there's a lot of like implications and preparation required. But fair enough, let's do it. So we have four steps to go. The first is to create a new deployment with a new name because name is an immutable field as well with the app and version labels. Then making sure that the existing service is serving both old and new deployments. Then we can create the HPA for the new deployment to make sure it is scaled properly. And then finally delete the old deployment. It it's, looks simple, but if you retry this for like, 300, 400 services, I wish you good luck. But joke aside, we cannot really rely on luck in our field, isn't it? So we need a more sustainable approach. So our current approach is to leverage the CD continuous delivery tooling. So we're using Spinnaker, for example, to automate that migration. You create pipe migration pipeline that the users just need to run one time when onboarding to Istio. And the good thing is that the approach is quite similar to Canary release. So you gain real time by investing into this. Then about the Istio retry policy, uh, my, we were wondering what's coming next after headless services and labels. And now we have two more surprise from Istio and good or bad, it's your judgment. Uh, but in fact, Istio retries all HTTP requests twice by default. So it's quite fun when you have non-idempotent APIs and you can confess because we are all in the same boat. You, you must have some APIs like that in, in somewhere, uh, but, uh, and it's not the only surprise. You ha we have an even better surprise, which is that we cannot disable it or change it, at least not the default level. 
So that's terrible because you're stuck with adding a retry policy with every single Kubernetes service that is served by Istio. So even if you started the adoption, when you want to reach over Kubernetes services that, are don't, that don't have Istio yet, you have to do this to ensure that you call them safely when they have non-idempotent uh, stuff. So it's kind of a loose coupling between non-Istio and Istio. So that uh, I opened an, ist an issue last year that was really uh, like, huge support from the community uh, and explain quite well the problem, hopefully. But thankfully, the community is working on a solution. And I, I want to use this occasion to emphasize that contributing is important and giving feedback, helping, discussing is helping everyone to build a better solution for everyone. And while I'm being a bit ironic at some points in this slide, I am extremely grateful in the community and maintainers for helping and improving Istio. So thank you so much for all the hard work. Uh, and But in our case, we didn't really have the time to wait for the adoption. So what did we do We for this year? That's the kind of last resort thing you should consider in the last position of all your possible options and that you cannot wait until another solution is happening. But in our case, it wasn't that big deal because it's just a one-liner change in the code. We just removed all the status that we thought unsafe for non item potency and just kept the connect failure. And it's pretty simple to, to release your own build of Istio. You only need to build the Istio pilot part for our change, for example, build the image, push the tag, and use it in the op Istio operator manifest. Be careful, we don't ask people to fork Istio. It's like if you really need it as a last resort, that's what we did. Uh, and the next adoption challenge is about Istio proxy performance and capacity. Because putting sidecars everywhere has a huge cost. Uh, latency, but mostly compute resources. Some reference values uh, from the community, I will not go through there. But we need to ask ourselves, what do we want when implementing Istio? So usually we want uh, added value to the business. It can be agility, observability, security. We, we want reliable performance to minimize the performance loss from the data path overload, overhead and to keep reliable systems. And we also want the reasonable cost by just consuming and paying what we need for. And if you put it in another way, it's about knowing your trade-offs such as how acceptable is the performance loss for the added value or how much should we pay for the added value? And to answer these questions, we need to take a look at what are our use cases. And in fact, each workload may be different, even if in the same product, we have some examples here. Then how do you define uh, a common answer to the previous questions? It's really ne nearly impossible because it changed so much uh, from one to one, and you need to involve a lot of people to understand and think about this. So considering that, we need to think of use cases that will give us an answer, and the cost part is in partly answered by the compute cost of Istio. And there is an, a fact in Istio that when you is enable Istio in all pods in a cluster, for n pods, you have n sidecars. And the case one we, we choose here, for example, is uh, one size fits all, so you, you take your biggest workload, you put the default size uh, to fit that capacity, and then it's easy to set. You have one thing you know, it will fit everything, but the cost is terrible because you have so much waste on everything uh, that it may be totally crazy that uh, you, your boss, your colleagues may, may think you're crazy. Uh, and the second case, it's to add, adjust based on, on specific workloads. So the resource cost is low because you really fit the perfect uh, value of resources for each workload, but the cost is tremendous in load testing and adjusting each of values. So for us, the one size fits all was really too costly for us and maybe for you too. Uh, and how can we adjust the sidecar size? Then we have the VPA that is not working for sidecar. We have the HPA that is not applicable. and so the only way we found was to load test uh, ourselves. But we just want a dynamic smart autoscaler for Saika. So if anyone has that or is working on that or needs help on that, we will be, we will be really happy to help with. Uh, so 
when load testing a service uh, Istio sidecar, we need to ask a few questions. How many RPS would we have without Istio? And also, how many hops per request? So basically, how many requests we generate when we get one request from the client? If we call a lot of services, we have a lot of different requests. And that looks like that three use case. So the, the first one is you have two uh, requests at any time in the service A part. And in the most right uh, diagram, you have five requests at any time. So depending on the topology, it totally differs uh, the need for, for that service. And one quick example, uh, very quickly, two requests, uh, 10K RPS at library level. Uh, with each RPS, it's like 20K. But when you have five requests, it's like 50K for the same RPS count. And then if you add pods, it's totally different because you will have a different kind of RPS per pod. So the, the sizing will be totally different. So that's pretty hard to, to nail it down. And also the Android concurrency setting is also very important for performance. It's two by default in Istio. Uh, and I don't remember if it's the default in Envoy too, but from minimal performance impact, you should have at least one worker per vCPU and maybe more than that because there are some like uh, CPU management in uh, Linux kernel. Uh, then you need to load test your workloads at different level of concurrency and resources uh, and account for the RPS per pod when calculating the capacity and beware of the HPA which can change a lot of things. So the capacity differs greatly depending on both CPU resources and concurrency. So the last part of this section is about abstracting Istio. And let's ask some questions. Should you expose a whole new layer of YAMLs to people that are already overfed with that? The answer is no. If you want to say yes, you're kind of static, I think. <laughs> uh, should you require your users to understand every single parameter in the virtual service? The answer is also no. And the main reason is probably that you're paid basically to improve your user's productivity, not decreasing it. So in the same way as we build libraries and interfaces to improve productivity, we need to build the proper abstractions to maximize the added value of Istio to our users. So for example, we have like automating the Istio onboarding, or making a Istio feature fully automated and managed, and it improves by a lot the user experience for developing services and the maintainability of Istio for operators. So here, how we abstract Istio quickly, we are using Terraform to handle the sidecar CRD policy and GitOps CI CD pipeline to, to apply them. And we are also exploring QLang to template a simple DSL for managing uh, various features such as full Istio onboarding through managed canary release with Maker, the one with baseline and more coming in the future. Okay, then now the takeaways of the last uh, part, uh, adopting Istio. So we saw that headless services are erratic with Istio. So better use cluster IP services instead and to plan the migration wisely. Uh, using automation pipelines to label the deployments for traffic shifting helps a lot uh, to reduce the cost for migration. Uh, Istio has a risky default retry policy for non idempotent APIs. So uh, we forked Istio to solve it in temporary, but hopefully the community uh, proposal will be um, uh, merged within this year, hopefully. Uh, and having sidecars everywhere is a huge cost. So make sure to mitigate it by prioritizing with testing. And finally, abstracting the Istio features is the real only way to spread the adoption and maximize the added value for Istio. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, if you're interested in helping us to go to the next step in adopting Istio and share your findings with the community, we don't hesitate to reach me via Twitter, LinkedIn, and the link for our team's job description is in the slide. So don't hesitate. Thank you so much for today. I, I, it's been a pleasure at that time, even though to, to have you today. Thank you.